If you have a class book, we're on lesson six. If not, or if, even if you do, we're in, going to start Isaiah 49 in just a moment. Isaiah 49. Uh, it's good to have everyone here this morning. As we begin, I'd like to ask Brother Billy Lewis to lead us in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for another Lord's day that we could come here to study your word, to enjoy the company of other Christians. We pray, Lord, that you'll open our minds and hearts as we study these lessons this morning, that we might serve you better, most of all, love you more and love others more. We pray this prayer in your holy name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's um, had a, a lot of us had a busy weekend. Um, pr- appreciate everyone that helped with the um, the breakfast yesterday. Had another good crowd. Um, and stay tuned. I think what six weeks, six more weeks. On um, the end of September, we'll do a, do another one. And uh, you know, we've had good turnout from the community. We delivered some of the food down to some of the um, businesses down through here that let us put signs out and. It was much appreciated, but uh, it's, it's, um, a number of folks in the community have made mention of how much they appreciate that. So um, it's made some contacts as well with um, some people that I think have shown interest in coming and, and being with us here or visiting. So hopefully it's opening some doors figuratively and literally. But anyway, I uh, appreciate all those who helped with that. It, it takes all of us working together to do things. So I appreciate that involvement. We've been looking at the book of Isaiah, and, and it... it a number of different themes within Isaiah. I mean, Israel um, and Judah, their sins against God. They were, they were supposed to be God's people. But while they wore the name that God had given to them, you know, they wore the name of Israel. They're supposed to be God's people, God's chosen people. They weren't always practicing the things that they were supposed to do. Uh, we notice in Isaiah 48, he says, Who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. That sums up a lot of the religious world today, doesn't it? Where you, they, they um, swear by the name of the Lord, make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth and righteousness. I mean, they'll say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a, God, you know, I'm a God-fearing person. I believe in the Bible. But then you begin to listen to the things that they believe and what they teach. And it's not true. It's not truth. And then... Um, as far as their life, it's not a righteous life. And, and we need to be careful as Christians that we don't fall into that category as well. Um, it just amazes me. Um, I, I've told you many times, I like on articles, I like to read not only the article, but I like to look in the comments section and you kind of get a, a pulse on different people's thoughts. And somebody put a cartoon in there about something about judgment and, and somebody said, that's Jesus wouldn't do that. That's not Jesus. Somebody gave a cha- book, chapter, and verse of where Jesus did exactly whatever that little cartoon was talking about. And they, they go, that's not the Jesus I believe in. And I was thinking, well, you know, if you don't believe in that Jesus, you really don't believe in Jesus. But Israel had really redefined God, um, just really one of many gods, um, worshipped idols. And as far as God's concerned, they didn't do everything God wanted them to do or how God wanted them to do it. And... They were stiff-necked, we saw in the last, um, the last chapter. They made idols and worshipped them. Uh, and we talked about making idols. You know, you get to shape it the way you want and, and get it to say what you want to say as opposed to God shapes us and we do what he says. Any comments to this point? You know, again, they're being called out on their sins. Um, judgment coming. Um, it, um, Judah would go off into Babylonian captivity. But there's also a future hope as well. God's punishing them, but God says, I hadn't forgotten you, I still love you. And God is the God who keeps his promises, and the promise still was going to be for the Messiah to come, the Christ to come. You asked Yes. Right. Christ has come. All Christians are now chosen race. Right. Predominantly the United States of America. Okay. And we need to take all things that happen to the first chosen race and apply them to ourselves here today and now. That's true. Yeah, it's a it's written for our learning. You know, we learn from history. We're supposed to learn from history. I mean we look at our country and you look at every nation that's ever come, you know, 
we never seem to learn. We, like you think, you talk about socialism, we wonder how can that keep going? Everybody thinks they can get it right the next time, you know? And our communism, you know, we can get it right the next time. They don't learn from history. You look at um, religious matters, you look at God's word, we look at Israel, and we should learn from Israel's mistakes. I mean, they were God's chosen people. Uh, they rebelled time and again. God punished them time and again, and look where it led them. And yet we're the spiritual seed of Abraham. We are the spiritual Israel today. And um, what about us and our relationship to God? I mean, we're his people and his chosen people. Do we make idols? You may say, well, I don't shape an idol, but covetousness is called idolatry. Um, anything we place on the throne above God is, is an idol. Do we um, commit idolatry? Do we worship other gods? Do we want to be like the world around us? And like, you know, sometimes people want to be like every other religious group and fit in and not stand out or stick out. Um, do we make, shape God into our own image? Um, again, we're supposed to learn from this. I mean, we're, and why do we think that the end result for us is going to be any different than it was for them? I mean, they condoned all sorts of things they shouldn't have condoned. And God's saying, look, you know, if you, if you don't stand up against this sin or that sin, there's certain things where they're supposed to put people to death on certain things. He says, if you don't do it, you'll be held accountable. And today, people will kind of push aside God's word. Not that we have to go out and stone people, I mean, but still, there's things we're supposed to do and, and teach and stand for. And people will push it aside and hope or just believe or just say God's going to, it's going to be okay. And so we have to be careful there. Other comments? So much has changed. Yeah. Yes. So much has changed, but it really hasn't. I'm like you say, it's just people are the same, and it's, it, and God's the same. Right. Well, you know, talking about that, First Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10 is a, is a good passage that brings that comparison there. More First Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. It's kind of interesting that they were baptized under, in the, the cloud and the sea. It's, it's a figure of baptism there. Um, it's, it's interesting that it stresses that when so many people discount it. Um, they, they had the same spiritual food, the same spiritual drink, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. I mean, you know, most of them were not pleasing to God. Now these things became our examples. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let, us commit, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complain and were destroyed by the destroyer. You know, some of these things are things that we've, some, some might say, well, I wouldn't do that. But then you get down to things like complaining. And now all these things happen to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the end, ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And so, then he goes on talking about with every temptation there's a way of escape. So he's saying, look, learn from these. You know, learn from the example of Israel. Don't make the same mistake they did. And, and so, 
there, there's strong lessons for us. There's a reason to go back and, and read the Old Testament, and part of it is we need to learn. Um, you know, there's examples there for us. Any other thoughts? Go to chapter 49 of Isaiah. Um, and, and some of it not only looks at their sins, but again, it looks at the righteousness and the promises of God. And ultimately, those promises are fulfilled with the seed of Abraham that's to come, the Messiah, the Christ, comes. And I think you get some glimpses of that in chapter 49. Listen, O coastlands, to me. Take heed, you peoples, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb and from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. Um, you know, again, from within the mother, he's called me by name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Let's stop there for a moment. When he talks about the one that he called from the womb, the one that he made mention of his name, the one he protected, who is this servant he's talking about? Ultimately, it's Christ, isn't it? I mean, it says Israel here, and some will say that everything is about Israel here in the sense of Israel's, it's all about Israel's chosen, it's Israel remaining, but really the emphasis is on Christ. Um, the Galatians were told that, in, in Galatians chapter 3 that, hey, you've lost, you, you got so caught up in the law, you've lost sight of the purpose of the law was the schoolmaster bring you up to Christ. I mean, it's, it's, it's salvation in Christ. And here, I mean, he he's, is saying some things that if you look at, it's really descriptive of Christ. Um, we talk about that we're the spiritual Israel, and that term Israel as well can be in a spiritual sense. You think about Christ, and he's the head of the body, the church, the spiritual seed of Abraham, and um, you, can, you can look at that there in that sense. Um, if you notice in, I know like in the, the New King James and some of the other versions, it capitalizes um, like you are, um, certain words there on some, on some of the things, on some of the things that are mentioned there, but his servant, servant is capitalized, uh, which I mean, it usually is a refer, referral to God or to Christ. Um, I think that's where most of the emphasis is. Some will try to look at some different things and take Christ out of the equation here. But listen to what it has to say. The Lord called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. So um, when was it planned? When was Jesus, when did he become the son of God? I mean, he's always been God. But when did he become the son of God? When he was sent to earth, when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit within Mary. Um, yeah, when, when, when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit with, with Mary, right. he became the Son of God. I mean, he was God, he was God the eternal word. God okay, there we go, that's the word. The, the incarnation took place, the, God incarnate in, in, in body. Um, and there's some things here in this that you could look at as far as um, when, when does human life begin? I, I think everything in the scripture shows it begins at conception that within the womb you have, you know, we, we say somebody's a mother to be. Well, no, they're really already a mother um, when, when they're expecting. Um, you know, I understand what they're saying, you know, the baby will come and then you say, well, you take care of it then. Well, no, you should take care of that baby when it's within you too and protect it. Uh, so, every, you know, everything shows life within the womb, human life, a human being, a person created in the image of God. But here you look at talking about Christ, he said even from within his mother, you know, from the womb, he's been called by name. When was he called by name? Do you remember? I mean, what, I mean, you have, I mean, you have, yeah, John the Baptist is another example there where he, jumped, he left within the womb at that point. But didn't the angel say, you'll call his name? Emmanuel or Jesus, I mean, I think he says that well. You know, so I mean, he's called by, now, even before he's born, he is who he is, and you call, his, his name is Jesus. I mean, he's going, his, his name is Jesus, and, and uh, Emmanuel, God with us. And so even the mention of the name before his birth, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. What does that infer? I was thinking about in the book of Revelation, um, you know, that, that image of, um, of Jesus. 
of Jesus with that sword coming out of his mouth? Okay, and it, it can hurt sometimes, can't it? Yeah. Okay, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It gets you go, going and coming. Um, it pierces. It can divide, you know, soul and spirit. Um, as you said, it can it convicts you. Now you can reject it, uh, but I, the image and I can't remember the past in Revelation gives that sword coming out the out the mouth, and. And that's, that's the image we think of with Christ. I mean, he is the conquering Savior, but it's not with military might like we think of. It wasn't with swords and spears then. It's not with tanks and, and um, missiles today. It is with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, uh, that he conquers. And you think about the gospel beginning in Jerusalem, going to Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, the power of the gospel, as Billy said, it... it it convicts you. Have you ever um, been in a situation where you're reading the, the Bible and it just hits you hard? I mean, uh, you think about David when Nathan was con confront when Nathan the prophet confronted him and said, "Thou art the man." It knocked him down. I mean, he why he didn't see it before? I mean, he was so caught up in sin. I don't know. Uh, but at that point, he was convicted by the, the word of God through the prophet Nathan. On the day of Pentecost, those people were convicted by the word of God that they had crucified the Son of God. And they, they wanted to know, what, what can we do? Saul was convicted by the word of Jesus. When, you know, he, Saul saw, why, or thou why are you persecuting me? And, and he was convicted, realizing Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and I'm, I'm doing that. Um, you look at Stephen, when he preached, oh, it, it hit them in the heart, it cut them to the heart. What did they do? <laughs> they got mad and killed him. And so, I mean, it, it, it touched them, but they reject it. It's not a forcing thing. But you look at the power of Jesus, the Son of God, I mean, the power of, as a creator, the power uh, uh, that he had to do all the miracles that he did and even to rise up from the dead. And yet you look at the way in which he doesn't force us to become a Christian, to, to submit to his will. He didn't force Israel. He doesn't force us. And yet he does tell us. The power of a word. You know, you, you listen to people, and there's some people that can, can just stir up a crowd with just the power of the word, or they can deflate a crowd with, with the power of some of the things they're saying, just, or whatever. You know, there's power, you know, we say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words are powerful, and they can build up, they can tear down. But you look at the sword that comes out of his mouth. I mean, it's, it's the word of God. The eternal word made flesh, and then we have the word of God written down. That's been given to us as well, and he. Um, so here is the one that's a born, that's to be born, born of the virgin. Um, we'll notice in other passages, but um, you know, again, the name Jesus, Emmanuel. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. Can you think of any instance that could refer to? I mean, I'm not saying it's just one instance, but. What does that refer to anyway? In what way was he hidden in the shadow of God's hand? Do you remember when, when he was born, they had to take the flight down to Egypt? They had to, you know, they had to get, get out of town, go down to Egypt for a while uh, so that he would not be put to death. God protected him and kept him safe at that point. I mean, they made sure that Joseph and Mary got out of town and then came back when it was um, safe. Um, again, God watching over, the Father watching over the Son and, and taking care there. Um, and again, when he hung on the cross, it wasn't that God did not care, it was God's plan. A polished shaft in his quiver, quiver he has hidden me. I mean, there's that, that arrow that's there. I mean, um, we think about the, the arrows of Satan, but then here's the arrow of God, here's the, the one who straight and narrow, uh, one who points the way to heaven as well, uh, the one that pierces through to our heart in a good sense. Other thoughts on that? He said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. I mean, you look at Israel in the Old Testament and they were to glorify God to the world around about. They fell down on that job many times. What about us as Christians? We are to glorify God. 
We're to let our light shine so that people will glorify the Father in heaven. Uh, we're the city set on a hill, you know, and not hid under a basket. That's the way we're supposed to be. And, um, you know, you just, uh, people are watching. People are listening. And, um, you know, whether you know certain people or not, they may know you. And they may know that you're a Christian. And they'll judge the church. They'll judge Christianity. They'll judge Christ by the life that you live or that I live. And we need to be very careful that we glorify Ultimately, God is glorified in Jesus Christ. How did Jesus glorify the Father when he was here on earth? Doing what he was asked to do. I mean, he had that mission and he fulfilled it. Not my will, but thine be done. How else? How did Jesus glorify the Father? And then that forgiveness is offered just a few weeks later on Pentecost. Yeah. But, you know, you look at Jesus. He helps us to understand as best we can in our finite minds what God is like. I mean, he puts it in fleshly terms so that we can understand and we can comprehend. I mean, he came as a sacrifice, but he also came so we could see God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When you see his love to die on the cross, when you see his compassion weeping over certain situations and, and care and trying to gather them like a mother hen would gather the chicks and they wouldn't. I mean, the rejection many times and yet he kept on doing what he was supposed to do. I mean, we, we see the goodness and the severity of God. You look at him with the money changers in the temple. They, they were corrupt and not what they should be and he drove them out of the temple on two occasions. And um, so you, you see, you get a picture of God there. He glorified the Father. He came to do the Father's will as Brother Pugh said. Oh, absolutely. That's a good point. At the baptism of Jesus, I mean, you know, he's submitting to, it wasn't that he had sins to be forgiven, but he was doing it to fulfill all righteousness. I mean, uh, you know, John, even John realized, you need to baptize me, not me, you. And, and yet Jesus did it and as an example. And then when you have him coming up out of the water, submitting to the will of God, you have... The Holy Spirit descend like a dove. The voice of God is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And so you, you have the glorifying of God there. And when a person today, when, like you said, when they're baptized, I mean, it's, it's because they're wanting to become a Christian, they want their sins forgiven. But as a person acknowledges their faith in Christ, you know, saying, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then as they are baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, they rise up, it's, it's glorifying God. You're saying, look, I'm trusting in God for salvation. I'm looking to Jesus and his death, the blood of Christ to cleanse me. And, and it's preaching a sermon to people that, it's, you know, I'm, I'm submitting to the will of God. I'm, I'm obeying the gospel. And it brings glory to God. And then as we live that life, it does as well. Other comments? Yes. Okay. Okay, so he, he just, I mean, there he's acknowledging that he, he is glorified. And, the, and so what's he look, what is he looking forward to? The future glory of being back like he was before? Yeah, that shows you, though, what he gave up to come to earth. You know, he, he emptied himself, but then, where you go? Okay. Yeah, I mean, he... He brought glory to God by finishing, being committed, hanging on the cross saying, it is finished. And I mean, wasn't you saying his life there as he's dying on the cross, that it's finished. And it's just not just the sacrifice for sin, but the whole plan, the whole thing. I mean, he had done everything he was supposed to do. He had accomplished what he's supposed to, to accomplish. And he, that he brought glory to God. And so we look at our life. How can we bring glory to God? We're not told to go and die on a cross. It may come down to us being killed for the cause of Christ one day, but... We're supposed, to, we're supposed to live for Christ. We bring glory to him by obeying the gospel. We bring glory to him by living the Christian life, by fulfilling the task that's there. You know, you never know what little things can make huge differences. I mean, I, I know 
people who have become Christians because somebody reached out to them in just little ways. And, you know, that the, the person who did it didn't realize how significant what they were doing or what they were saying was, but it touched hearts and touched lives. And there's things we can do in big and little ways that can reach others. Um, you know, we look at, well, even like the breakfast yesterday morning. I mean, that's an example of there's people that have they have come to that that would not have come otherwise that you can sit down and talk to over uh, over some food and and discuss, and discuss things and encourage them and it, it, it hopefully that'd be the first step leading to some other things as well but um do we bring glory to god in our life we bring glory by doing the father's will other comments yes yeah, that's, that's how christ did and then he said um verse four Isaiah 49, 4. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have kept my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. I mean, that, you know, again, it's, it's a matter of serving God, being faithful to him and um, doing the task at hand and eternal glory waiting. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. I also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so, you know, some will look at this time talking about the future glory of Israel, but it's not in the sense of what what they were looking for, earthly king, earthly kingdom, and, and those type of things. He gives a hint of it here saying, Look, it's not just for the physical seed of Abraham. It's for the Gentiles as well, um, Jew and Gentile. Um, we're all one in Christ. And then what's Galatians 3, 27, you know, you're baptized in Christ, you put on Christ, and then we're, the, spirit, we're the, the spiritual seed of Abraham, he goes on and says. You know, that's how we become the seed of Abraham. And, and so his mission, his goal was to come in the fullness of time at the right time, to be born of the virgin, to live that life, to seek and save the lost, to, to show God to us and ultimately to die on the cross for our sins. And as the gospel is preached, it does begin with the Jew, the physical Jew, the descendants of Abraham. But then it's not long before it goes beyond that to the Gentiles as well. And for that, we should be thankful You know uh, that it's not just for Jew, but it's for Gentile as well. And so uh, it's, it's a different type of kingdom, a different seed of Abraham, if you will, uh, that he's talking about here, but still the same principles involved. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to whom man despises, to him, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers. Was Jesus despised? Yeah, absolutely, wasn't it? Do I despise and reject it? Yeah. You know, how, how do you feel when you try to talk to someone about the gospel and you're trying, you know, you're trying to to study with them or just get them interested even just in visiting or something and they just reject you outright. How does it make you feel? Not too good, does it? And, and, and you get, it's easy to get down in the dumps. I mean, and, and you just want to give up, give in. That's what it should do. You just, yeah, don't save me. Yeah, I mean, like, a, a person in a, a burning building says, don't rescue me. A person that's drowning doesn't take that hand. Or the, you throw a life preserver, a you know, life vest out there, or life ring, and they just push it away. And, and you know. I say the next bit would be if Christ did punish the apostles, when they rejected the truth, they went to what? Dust off your feet and go to death. And that's, a, you know, yeah, I mean, um, you reach that point. I've only had one person wipe their dust off their feet and hold up their hand and curse me. So, uh, I, I was was doing service at Grill Mental Hospital in Montgomery, and there was some um, and there was a mental patient there. Got he got at, he got mad at me about something, and um, it was a misunderstanding. And I knew that he, his mind wasn't quite right, but still, that's I said. Now I understand how a person would feel when somebody would take the shoe off, wipe the dust off, hold it up, and curse someone. He forgave me and brought me a present with some apple seeds in it so, um, the next week. So I, I, it was, it was, but still, I mean, it's, it, as I said, you know, that's just a, especially when it's in the building and the voice was just booming off the ceiling. But um, I said, I can, if a person has a heart at all, I mean, it, it bothered me uh, enough that I tried, you know, 
it was a misunderstanding about us giving out Bibles. He didn't, we had run out and he didn't have one. He thought we refused the word of God to him. And so I brought him one that, I got one out of my dorm room and brought it to him that afternoon. But you know, the thing is, I mean, you reach a certain point that you don't want to cast your pearls before swine and, and things and um, you, you have to move on. Um, but at the same time, do what? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, you get the thing. I mean, but you look at them, they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ. They're not just rejecting you, they're rejecting salvation. And that's what's so sad. Don't let the ones that reject keep you from continuing to invite, continuing to try to study, continuing to try to reach out. Because Jesus himself was rejected many times, the Son of God. And if they rejected him, they're, they're going to reject us. Uh, and we, we're not always perfect. Now, sometimes we may do things that cause, that rubs people the wrong way, and it's our fault. And, you know, we, we preach the truth, and we need to do it in a way that we're trying to win souls. But at the same time, even then, we're going to have people that, some that reject. But then there's the ones that, there's no feeling like when you have, when you teach someone, and you can see that light bulb go off, you can see their heart kind of opening up, and, and they're receptive to the truth, and they obey the gospel. I mean, that's a wonderful thing. And then if you see them continue, you encourage them and study and, and see them faithful, that's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. But it's not going to always be that way. There's going to be those that will reject. Always has been, always will be. Israel did it to God. Um, they did it to Christ when he was here on earth, and they'll do it to us today. But we can look time and again where he was despised, rejected. In fact, they meant evil by crucifying him. But that was still God, God, the Son of God giving himself for our sins. Jesus went willingly, but there was an evil intent on their part. You look at what they did to Stephen uh, as far as stoning him to death. But um, he says, you know, there, there was a rejection. The nations abhor. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. I mean, on the, on the one hand, there's rejection. On the other hand, there's there are many that will understand and that will bow the knee, you know, as it were, uh, and, and accept him for who he is. And, you, you know, it's, it's, you see great and small that, that, that have become Christians. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause him to inherit desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. And so, I mean, there, there's a way that's there. There's a, there I mean, there's Christ coming. Um, the day of salvation came, has come. I mean, you look at the, the fullness of time Christ came and was born. When, it, when, his, when the time had come, he set his face to go to Jerusalem to offer himself. And then on the day of Pentecost, after Christ ascension back into heaven, the gospel was preached. Um, people, you know, the church was established. The Lord added the saved to the church. And then that kingdom began there and has gone and spread throughout the world. And, um, you know, Billy mentioned earlier, talking about our country, and you know, we've been blessed in our country um, in so many ways. And you look at the, the number of Christians we have in our country, and yet when you look at percentages, the percentage is going down and down and down and down. Uh, and especially when you look at, at, at true Christians. And, um, but um, still, the power of the gospel uh, to, to spread to people, to preserve us, to help us, um, the salvation that is there, Christ doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, the grace that was extended. Um, and it says, look, they shall feed along the roads, their pastures shall be on all the desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, nor heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and in my, in my highway shall be elevated. Surely they, they shall, these shall come from a far look, those from the north and the west, those from the land of Sinem. And so, what's he saying here? What's going to happen? Is it a health and wealth gospel that if you're a Christian, nothing bad's going to happen to you? We know that's not true. What's he saying then? In what way will the, the, there be pasture? In what way will we not hunger and thirst and not have the, the heat uh, or whatever? Any ideas? I got out and cut my grass yesterday about 3 o'clock, and I, I felt the heat, so... <laughs> You know, there's going to be some heat at times, but what, what, is it, what do you think he's saying? What's the idea of 
of the cool breeze. I mean, got out the other evening and feel that cool breeze blowing. Okay, spiritual it's the blessings that are in Christ and spirituality, the cool the the cool springs of water. Um, nothing like on a hot day having a, a cool drink. Of, have you ever had fresh spring water, um, or even just a cup of ice water? The refreshing, uh, the refreshingness of that of the cool breeze or whatever. Just the blessings of life. I mean, the idea that that we blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, I think a spiritual hunger that's 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 fulfilled. You know, you look at the amount of money that people spend trying to find purpose for being here. I mean, you look at, like, I, I enjoyed the things, like, with, the, with the, the, space, the space industry, NASA, and some of the things that uh, is amazing, some of the photographs they come back with. But for most people within the space industry, the whole idea behind it was, I mean, there's other things now, but really it was, where do we come from? How did it all begin? Where did this universe come from? And you think about all the billions of dollars that's spent on trying to explain away Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. And, you know, I mean, trying to find answers just with, with theistic, uh, well, um, either theistic evolution or no evolution at all, just trying to, well, really, mo most trying to explain away God. But, um, and the answer's right there before them. I mean, you know, we, we read all sorts of self-help or try to find self-worth, self and yet, the best help we can ever find, the only true that really matters is in Christ. And um, if we question our worth, Jesus thought it was worth dying for. But, I mean, he said, look, there, there's that purpose in life, to serve the Lord, to, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to be a light to the world, to go to heaven. That's our goal one day. And, and we have blessings that people cannot take away from us no matter what happens. And the mercy of God has been extended to us. And I mean, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, with every temptation, there's a way of escape given to us. You look at the gospel spread, it's spread throughout the world in amazing ways. Um, you know, there's obstacles that are placed at times, but God's word continues on. And people, you know, even on the day of Pentecost, people came from around the, the known world at that time. They were in Jerusalem. And then it, the gospel went and carried it throughout the world at that time. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break out and sing, you know, mountains for the Lord and will have mercy on his afflicted. And so there's that future hope coming. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. And I mean, you know, they would look at it. They go off, they're, they're going to be in punished going off into captivity. The Lord's forsaken me. And you ever hear people today say, where's God? God's forsaken me. You know, God doesn't love me. Uh, people blame God for a lot of things. Uh, we live in a sinful world that has a lot of problems in it. But um, God has not forsaken us. He loves us. Now, some people forsake God. But um, God loves us. And, and, but they would look at it and say, you've for, forsaken me. No, they had turned their back on God. He goes, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. Well, a true loving mother is not going to forget their child. I mean, you know, you know, sometimes there's tragic things where people forget certain things, whatever. But I mean, he said, you know, a, a mother is going to care for that nursing child. And even when the child's still within them, they, they, they love that, that child enough. They try to take care of themselves and make sure that that child, whether born or unborn, is taken care of. And, and that the mother's love to, as a sacrificial love is an amazing thing. He said, some may forget. I mean, we, we look at exceptions. We look at mothers that should have never become mothers and um, some that um, whatever else it may be. But he said, we understand in general, there's nothing like a mother's love for their child and the, the, the loving mother caring for and sacrificing for, for their child. Um, I've heard my father talk at times about um, when, they were, when they were young growing up and you know, had a bunch of kids in the family and they were very, very poor, didn't have much food. He said he can remember many a time his mother went without eating so they could eat, you know, just have food on the table. She, she tried to make sure they had food whether she did or not. And um, that sacrificial love that's there. And he said, you know, you may forget, but I won't forget you. Just like that mother and child, I won't forget you. I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. And there's, some, you know, you look at the pagans, they would inscribe the name of their God on their hand and maybe, you know, and, and cut it in there or tattoo it in there. 
to remember their God. And that was kind of a pagan ritual. But God said, in a greater way, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. God said, you know, I hadn't forgotten you. I know who you are. I, 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 you know, I, I know you are mine. I'm holding you in the palm of my hand, as it were. Your walls are continually before me. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. I mean, yes, there, there's going to be punishment at times, but I'll, I'll bring back you. I'll bring you back. I'll keep my promises. Lift up your eyes, look around, and see all those, all these together, and come to you as I live, says the Lord. You shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as an ornament, bind them on you as a bride does, as a bride does. For your waste and desolate places, and the land of your destruction will even now be too small for. Um, the inhabitants and those who swallowed you up will be far away I mean there's that future blessing the children you will have after you have lost the others will say again in your ears the place is too small for me give me a place where I may dwell I mean you know kind of a broadening then you'll say in your heart who has begotten these for me since I have lost my children and am desolate a captive and wandering to and fro who has brought these up there I was left alone but these where were they Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lift up my hand in an oath to the nations and set up my standard for my peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Um, I mean, he's saying, you know, you look at it and feel desolate and lost, but he said there's future blessing there, future hope, and future generations to come and ultimately in Christ. And God has, you know, God is still in control. Kings shall be your foster fathers and your queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am, your, I am the Lord, but they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. So what's he saying? I mean, there's future glory coming. There's a, there's a, there's a, king, there's a kingdom coming that will be established, and um, there's a sense in which we can you know, reign with Christ in the kingdom, um, you know, even here on earth, but ultimately in heaven as well. But the blessings that are there, he said, one day you, you'll be able to look and see you know, that God was still in control. And, you know, we, we look through the, from the New Testament perspective, we can look back and say, look, God was in control through all of this. And God's will was done. The Messiah came. But then we can get caught up in things as well, saying, where's God when this happened to me? Where's God when that happened to me? But God, God is there. And God lifts us up and carries us on. And then um, we'll, we are out of time right now, but we'll, we'll continue there next week and, and kind of tie up the loose ends on that and go on into the next chapter. But God, God is God. God's in control. God's will will be done. But learn from Israel and don't reject the will and the word of God.